body shot. Oh, that hurt, didn't it? When the adrenaline starts pumping and you know what you can do with this right hand, it's hard to not do that. Here are your hosts, Derek G and AJ. The Boston finisher Calvin Cater cruises to a unanimous decision victory against the ninja Giga Chikadze in very impressive fashion, such a fashion that reminds the MMA world while Calvin Cater is a top five fighter through and through, truly, man. I mean, listen, this begs the question, though. How good is Max Holloway? This is something we're going to talk about in just one moment, folks. Hogerio Bontarine is at the uh, at the middle of a little bit of controversy in his split decision loss against Brandon Rod Dog Roy Val. Ghost tap, Brazilian tap. Listen, folks, I do a little jujitsu myself, and I'll tell you I know a tap when I see one, and I think that was a tap, but we'll talk about that one. And lastly, folks, Invicta FC 45. This was something that we didn't really get into on the pre-show this this week, but I thought it was important to announce that Jessica Del Bonnie, she won a rematch against Alicia Zapatella in the Invictus Adam Weight Championship. Beat her like she owed her something. It was a very, very impressive fight. She uh, definitely thought she won the first fight, got the job done in the rematch. We're going to talk about all of this throughout the show. But you know, before we do any of that good stuff, I gotta bring on my co-host, the Santa Fe Bomber, the New Mexico native himself. AJ, brother, you're starting the year off on a high note, four and two, you got the early edge on me in the head-to-head -head pick em. I took a chance and some of them didn't pan out. But the first thing that I need to ask you about, man, is uh, something we're gonna talk about here in uh, in just a few moments when we actually recap it. Rogerio Bontarine did a, did a little, little little tap, little uh, you know what I mean? And, and try to get away with it, but it's something that we advocate for on this show because we say, if you're not cheating, you're not trying, you feel me? So he he tried to get away with a little something, man, but uh, I, I feel like a lot of people are, you, either, you have the people who say he either definitely did it or, or he definitely didn't. What is your take on that? brother did he do it was it a ghost tap brazilian tap what you think man i saw it when i saw it in real time i even jumped he tapped like i said i pointed i saw it i know it was a quick it was like one two yeah. like, oh no like, it was a it was a panic tap yeah. i definitely uh I, I wouldn't say he's necessarily cheated because mm -hmm. the ref didn't see it the ref didn't call it and he yeah. didn't you know nobody stopped so maybe on the ref right there i saw a tap brother i saw a tap 100 percent. yeah man and it is what it is you know it happens because that's kind of what the whole point is it's like you did it but if the referee didn't call it you're not gonna quit on your sub you're gonna keep it going and then try to find a way to that victory it reminds me a little bit of a fight that fabricio verdum had um uh, a couple months back at the pfl where verdum felt his opponent tap so he let up a little bit and then dude was like what the fuck like he stopped the fight he tapped you know i felt the tap but the referee didn't call it now we're glad that the split decision win went to roy val because that's karmic justice right there some of the stuff you talk about but nonetheless i think that this is going to be a, a bigger deal then people are making it out to be man because you can't do that stuff brother you know and roy val if the if roy val lost i think it would be a much bigger deal nonetheless folks um like i said man calvin cater big big win we'll talk about that brother but we had some we had some fun prelims over here too man you know for an example uh jamie pickett versus ugly man joe holmes right you know that was a fun back and forth fight i did not expect i was picking holmes on that one jamie pickett squeaked out a dub uh Listen, brother, your sleeper, Brian Kelleher versus uh, uh, Kevin Kroom. That was back and forth action, but the small man got the job done. Tell me your thoughts on that real fast. How in, like, how did that matchup play out the way that you kind of anticipated it to, being that Kevin Kroom was so much bigger and larger? Man, I, I was honestly expecting a little bit more fireworks, to be honest. That was a grinder of a match. Yeah. Back and forth, nonstop, up and down. That was a really good one to see because I didn't know Kevin Kroom had those kind of uh, the, the kind of chops to keep up with uh, Boone Kelleher and basically everywhere. Anywhere this, this fight took place, man. I was excited to see it. Like I said, a grinder of a match. I was expecting a little bit more haymakers thrown, but these dudes proved me wrong, man. Came in ready to, ready to work in them deep waters, man. It's very impressive. Yeah, absolutely, man. And then, I mean, I kind of agree with you, but it still was that nonstop action that you love to see. You know what I'm saying? But even in consideration, yeah, Kevin Crew, man, this is something that I was saying since his UFC debut. Um, he kind of shocked me there. And after that, I had to put some respect on the, on the man coming out of Glory MMA and said, listen, he's a gamer. He's ready to go. But Brian Kelleher said it himself. The man just kind of tires himself out. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it just, it's a war of attrition with that man. And uh, lastly, man, Charles Rosa versus TJ Brown. AJ, interesting set. I think Charles Rosa alternated wins in like 11 straight bouts where it was just win, loss, win, loss win loss unfortunately stepped in short notice didn't get the job done and now he's on a two fight losing skid to tj brown who uh you'd have to say man the man's wrestling and his striking acumen so impressive man for the first fight of the night of uh the first card of 2022 for the ufc man i think that that was a pretty good scrap what'd you think 
Oh yeah, they provided, man. They showed up for the first fight of the night, first fight of the year. It was nice. It was, and it was nice because it wasn't just a slugfest. You know, they were actually up and down, doing all the techniques, mixing it up. It was a good, it was a good welcome back to the sport, man. I was happy to see it. Absolutely, and uh, you know, it's hard to say that either of our sleepers delivered because it was only two finishes on the entire card. Um, let me make sure that's right. Yeah, that's right. Two finishes on the entire card. Both of them came on the main card. But my sleeper, Court McGee versus Ramiz Brahamai. Um, listen folks man this was something that i was talking about it said can the young submission artist uh can he take down and submit the anti-submission game the top game the wrestling of a court the crusher mcgee and the answer was clearly no 37 years old the man feels like he's in the prime of his career aj court mcgee is such an impressive figure in the sport however it's interesting because this is his first two fight win streak since uh let me see 2013 brother that's a long time that's many many years so let me just ask you really quickly before we kind of move on to the photo collection and all that what does it mean to you that a 37 year old is just putting it on the young guns like this man like it feels like the age of mma to where you need to retire or to where you could still have a solid chance at winning a championship is like a, is increased just like an nfl or nba or anything like that like lebron's killing it and it's like who who said who tells uh or who knows how old that man is man's like 35 37 you feel me still killing it top of his game do you think that just this is a major shift in sports this is the glover to share effect or what, what do you make of it I, yeah i think so man because we've been seeing older and older kind of be that prime age you know everybody's even even court mcgee said he's like i'm 37 i feel like i'm the best you know the best i've ever been way better than when I was younger. And it's crazy to see. I, I think it's honestly a lot to do with the, the sports psychology and the, the recovery and kind of things like that, man. Science is improving. And thankfully, it's allowing us as humans to get a little bit better as we get older. So there's always hope, man. Can't give up just because you're a little bit aged. You know, you can still get the get the work in, still hang with them young guns. You're, you're Court McGee who's proven it, man. It's very, very cool to see. And especially for the remainder of the years, you know, to see how things are going to keep growing in that aspect. Absolutely, brother. And it's just, this is a weird aside, but it just reminds me a little bit. You ever play like pickup basketball back in the day and you have like, you know, it's you and your, you and your buddies and all that good stuff, man. Then you got like someone's like 40 year old dad who is just like killing it, just like in a, in a tank top, you know what I'm saying? Ready to rock to taking it to everybody being like, listen, folks, like I might be old, but I'll still put it on your young ass. You know, that's kind of the, the vibe that I get with the court McGee's, with the Glover Teixeira's, with just some of those older dogs, the older UFC veterans who uh, lit, are saying like, okay, you have to go through me if you want to advance your career. Well, guess what? That's not going to happen, dude. And Court McGee, this is just the one thing where I actually picked Brahamai for this fight. And I'm just like, I fool myself every time. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, I understand what he was able to do to Sasha Palatnikov, but Court McGee is truly another level. We went over his resume, man, and said how good you have to be to fight the man. So it was something that was definitely interesting to see, but the fun prelims, folks, fun prelims on the first card back, man. You'd love to see it. And before, before uh, we move on, folks, I just want to give you a quick word. I told you on the last show, I said, hey, man, it'll be in in a couple of days. And we got it. The merch is here. Bloody Water Podcast. I got my hoodie. Go get your T-shirt. Go get your socks. Get whatever you need to do. But uh, we will have a link below. Use code BWP10 for 10% off all purchases at checkout for our online storefront. That's a great deal you got right there because it doesn't matter what it is. You get 10% off off the bat. So I will just put that out there. Drop a like, subscribe, all the good stuff. Uh, AJ, man, let's get into a little bit of photo collection, brother why don't we so um with that being said i don't have too many for you today man but it's something i just wanted to talk about and clearly we talked about a couple of these so just give me some quick takes on them so the first folks that i got or the first photo that i got excuse me folks is uh, uh brian boom kelleher man and this is him he just this is his third fight in a row where he's got a nasty cut over his eye it seems at this point like it's inevitable. Like he he said he went basically 20 plus fights or whatever, no cuts his whole career. He gets to the UFC, now he's getting cut up all the time. So he's bringing it, but he's not going to be able to come back in short notice for this time, you know what I mean, with, with that, you know, nasty, whatever you want to call it, slit over his eyelid or whatnot. What do you make of it? Oh, man. Yeah, I think it's just uh, when the level of competition increases, you know, they're going to be a little sharper in there. Catch them elbows, man. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is the worst spot that you don't that you don't want to be against a, a veteran like Brian Kelleher, man. Deep in the back, you cut him. So he's a little pissed off. You now he's got your chin 
Yeah, it's a rough one. Good picture, though. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. You love to see it. Um, this next one right here, this is just the face of a Ramiz Brahamai with a Court McGee crushing you. And it goes to show the control time for Court McGee. Round one, two minutes, 58. Round two, three minutes and 11 seconds. And then round three, three minutes and 35. This is, you got to understand, folks. And for those who are listening at home, Ramiz Brahamai is looking up almost in terror with a Court McGee crushing him. And uh, Ramiz Brahamai is nine and three, all nine wins via submission, credential jujitsu practitioner. Uh, beast in Fortis MMA, beast in the gym. And when you have just an OG 37-year-old dad strength dude just putting it on you, it's a different feeling. And I can tell you, AJ, I can relate to this because sometimes in the gym, you got the big dudes who are just crushing you. Who It doesn't matter what technique you do. They are nonstop, all pace, all cardio. And uh, sometimes, man, it's just that look up in terror of like, is this really happening to me? Give me your take on this. Man, you you hit the nail on the head, Derek. Look at Terry. This is the one look you never want to find yourself in where a dude's on your back. You're trying to breathe. He's got the triangle on you. You know, he's got the locks in and you're just looking up like somebody come, please come help me. Like, get this man off my back, please. Yeah, this is a rough one for Ramiz, man. But uh, great, great. Like you said, crushing it. You know, yeah. crushing up there is Court McGee, man. Awesome picture. Absolutely. And I just got to say this real fast, man. I, just give me give me your take on this. Does this not kind of remind you a little bit uh, of the brutality of the sport of uh, mixed martial arts or boxing or any of these individual one-on-one -on -one sports where truly nobody can save you? Yeah, your corner can throw in a towel, but nobody can save you. You're stuck in that cage alone. And sometimes you need to look up and say, damn. I need to do something to get out of this because nobody's going to do it for me, man. Isn't it, isn't it like a brutal reality shock, don't you think? Oh, man. It has to be one of the worst feelings in the world because you know you know, the second they lock that door, it's just mano a mano in there. And sure, the ref can save you. You know, the ref, you could, you could have your corner throw in that towel. A lot of times, though, you don't want that. You know, you want that, that feeling of you being the one, you being the dog in there locked in the cage and they're with you. But sometimes, man, you're the one in there that's struggling, looking at the time, praying, hoping, hoping that it ends quicker, man. Because, yeah, this is a, a brutal reality that they live in when the doors lock in that MMA cage, man. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of, like, uh, you know, being a little bit confident, being ready to rock and getting finding out you're locked up in that cage, uh, this is a picture of Charles Rosa entering that cage, hyped up, ready to go. And I love to see it. You love to see the energy. You love to see the intensity of a fighter like uh, Boston Strong Charles Rosa. But I wanted your take on the confidence like some fighters are different some people come in stoic some people come in calm relaxed rosa came in ready to scrap and ended up losing his fight so my question was do you think a little bit of your energy bar gets zapped down when you come up in the cage ready, just ready to rock steaming right you know what i mean kind of like a Corey sandhagen how he's just pacing back and forth throughout the cage that wasn't as the level of intensity as charles rosa jumping up through the air doing the whole nine but then again you had a joe anderson brito who sprinted into the cage and you know what i mean like put his shoulder down i just want to know what you make of the, the the people who come out really hot ready emotional does that zap your energy bar a little bit does that take anything away from you what do you think i think it does man and maybe not like uh your your physical energy you know you still have a lot of that gas tank but probably what's more detrimental is it takes away your mental gas tank sure you know that mental bit you're already your your body's ready for that adrenaline dump it's ready for that fight it's feeling all those uh, you know anxiety and emotions and everything you get in there a little bit and it, you have that ready to go and then your gas tank really starts going i think it affects you a lot more man yeah, yeah. Interesting, man. I think it's a good picture regardless, you know what I mean? Shout out Charles Rosa. But uh, yeah, didn't get the job done tonight or uh, this past Saturday night, I should say. Um, AJ, right here, this is just an interesting one because this is, I mean, I knew it was in the realm of possibility for Algeo to get the win. And he showed he's he's a very crafty veteran. Um, very, very crafty veteran. We'll talk about that in a second on the recap. But right here, this is him kind of like saluting the crowd. And folks who are listening at home, this is Bill Algeo. He's got one hook in on Joe Anderson Brito he's got a finger pointing in the sky and he's not paying any mind to his opponent he's looking out to the crowd and just kind of saluting and saying yeah I won this fight this is what I do it was interesting to me because um, even though I did think the decision was going out Gio's way when you're cruising to a decision you can almost never be that confident to be like oh yeah because imagine what if you lost like that would have been so embarrassing that would have been so embarrassing obviously it didn't happen so it's not something that we necessarily need to talk about but give me your take on the photo and people kind of um how would you say um respecting their work a little bit too much before the actual conclusion is there what do you think about that Man, it's a it's a dangerous game, especially when it's hands and feet flying in there. Cause imagine that Brito saw that 
just throws some some crazy something or other catches catches lgo you know next thing you know you're staring up at the sky like what in the world my hand was just up i mean good good president of mine for lgo yeah. though because he was winning the fight i i had the same thing you know he was winning basically every single round all for the majority of the fight as well too there's very few moments where he was losing but having the presence of mind to look up give a little salute I think it's a good, a good little showmanship, but ballsy, ballsy for sure. Absolutely. And this is a dude who, with this win, moves to two and two in the UFC. So he's back up to 500. So you're an under 500 fighter with that type of, it just goes to show the confidence, I think, of a Bill Algeo, which is something scary. It's going to be scary for other featherweights in the division because if he keeps fighting confident, man, that flow style, it's hard to get past, man. And I thought Brito had the answer, but clearly not. Um, okay, AJ, don't give me too much on it, man. But I just, I singled this photo out because I was all like, brother, you could see the hand. Like, I'm going to pull this up bigger, folks, for a second. You can see the hand of a Bontarine in motion of making the tap in the photo. Now, it's not as conclusive when you're not watching a video, but I watched this video back like a million times. And I was like, it's hard for me to not say that that was a tap. Because that happens in the gym all the time where dudes will give you the one tap. The, you know what I mean? It wasn't even two. This one was really just like a, like a one tap. But you're not just going to randomly smack somebody's thigh. You know what I mean? That's the universal sign of like, hey, okay brother you got me but like i said the referee did not intervene it's kind of similar to what we'll talk about in the main event for giga chikadze he had a nasty fence grab on one of these calvin cater takedowns and cater couldn't finish the takedown and i was just like if that was like something that decided the fight or like it was a real big influence to the decision of the fight that's just like that's fucking cheating but then again the referee didn't catch it so it is what it is but give me your take on the photo brother man he's in deep on that arm bar too yeah. and i agree like there's no I think you could you could phrase it a little bit like he was going for some defensive move and maybe that's how the, the you know he, the the hand slipped up and tapped but he's not going for the arms he's not going for the feet you know he's not trying to rip him off his head or anything there that that was a pretty solid yeah. tap and man uh, Roy Valls like I said he's in deep he's almost hips to the shoulder on that arm bar you know he had that thing locked in man. and he was saying in the post fight presser he was like I was really trying to break this dude's arm off so you know it goes to show it's like when and I'm telling it happens in a split second man all you have to do is crank hard enough and that elbow cyber extended nasty you know we'll talk about it in a second though lastly i just needed to say this is representative of what this entire card was but spe uh, specifically excuse me the main event for calvin cater he just throwing up the shh you feel me for those who are listening at home this is calvin cater his finger in front of his mouth proverbially proverbially is that the right word proverbially no probably i don't feel like i'm saying proverbially that right. you know well, what i'm know. trying you know what i'm trying to say the proverbial you know what i mean shush to the crowd saying hey listen folks y'all must have forgot he said it in the night nicest way possible because he didn't even need to use any words i must have forgot aj i'm gonna eat some crow in a second but for the meantime folks just take that for what it's worth that is the photo collection so if you have not yet drop a like subscribe we're at 325 subscribers slowly but surely making our way up so you know what i mean folks share it with your friends hit us up at bloodywaterpodcast.com and once again uh, bwp10 for 10 percent off all merch you can get you a nice hoodie like me bloody water podcast you dig we got the logo on the back i mean whether you like a t-shirt whether you like whatever the case may be we'll have more designs up here in the near future right now we only have one design on there for kind of all of the merch that you can get but as time goes we will grow and if you're digging us in the bottom right hand corner over there there's a qr code where you could drop a little bit of love show some love you know what time it is but aj man what's more important than the folks subscribing to the pod or to the podcast rating us five stars on apple Podcasts or on spotify and sharing it with your friends i mean that's got to be a little bit more important in the long run in terms of longevity and people seeing the show Am I right? Oh, 100%, man. And all that, what's nice about all that, all that's for free. You know, a yeah. couple couple button clicks, send it to the <laughs> homie, let it know people who, especially you like, they like fights, they like winning money, come holler at us. We got the picks going. You, you Derek listed in the beginning already, one of us four and two, you know, Derek's yeah. still at that 300 or 500, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah. Still, either way though, we got the picks, best MMA show in the network, man. You got to holler at us and it's all for free. Like you said, unless you want to drop some cash, help us grow even faster with the monetary. We love it. Yeah. We appreciate all of it regardless. Absolutely, folks, because if you don't do that, we're going to have to get some ads up in this joint, some sponsorships, you feel me? But we'll see. That's, an, that's a conversation for another time. But uh, AJ, brother, you right. Four and two. You were four and two. That means you were, I don't know what the percentage is, but you were a good percentage. I'm at 500. So that's what something that's important to note that even though I had a little slip up in the start, listen, 500 and better already off the bat. Come on, brother. We don't do no one and fours over here. Come on. What are we talking about, brother? All right, man. Um, 
So that was the photo collection, all that good stuff, man. But now I think it's a little bit of time that we dive into a little bit of a rankings dispute, brother. We need to jump into the women's flyweight division, I believe. And what I wanted to do here, AJ, is I just kind of wanted to talk about a fighter who is uh, a little bit, um, I feel like, underappreciated right now, especially in her division. And it's going to be tough because she's pretty much at the pinnacle at the top. But it's like, where do we go here? So my question for you, brother, my my rankings review is for number two, Caitlin Blonde Fighter Chukagin. She gets another UD win against Jennifer Maya, which was almost rinse, wash, and repeat uh, of the first fight, except a little scrappier. And Jennifer Maya was never really able to secure the takedowns. Instead, it was Chukagin that got the takedowns. We'll talk about it in a second. Nonetheless, with this 60 seconds ranking review brother what i want to talk about is this and what i'm going to do is i'm going to jump over to uh, our rankings really fast if you don't mind brother so this is right now the consensus ufc rankings um you'll see updated on december 14th because that was the last time there was a real need for an update but nonetheless um basically you'll see aj and my ranking right on over here folks both of us have caitlin chukagian at number two just alongside with the ufc consensus rankings both of us have jessica andraj at number one with the ufc consensus rankings and jennifer maya was at number three so being that caitlin chukagian for a second brother let me come back for a second um given that caitlin chukagian um basically number two beat number three um there's really most of the division she's already kind of gone through one of my main questions to you is, has she done enough to jump back up to that number one spot to be pretty much the next challenger for Valentina, given that the division is so dry? I mean, if you think about it, there's two fighters who you can arguably say, hey, Valentina, why not? Let's just give you a fight. And that's Alexa Grasso, who honestly has not done much in the women's flyweight division yet, just because, you know, people pulling out of fights, all that good stuff. And Tyler Santos, who is the dark horse of the division. So I don't want to spoil my matchmaking, but basically at this point, Chukagin can either fight them or say, hey, man, she's won three since Jessica Andrade fought her last and you know she lost with that body shot fight Jessica Andrade to determine who's number one who then fights Valentina my point is 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 Caitlin Chikagian stuck in in number two women's flyweight purgatory like is she stuck there can she come back to number one and do you think she'll be facing a champion in the near future what do you think yeah, that's exactly where my head was going, Derek. I feel like she's a little bit lost in limbo right there, man. With especially losing with a devastating body shot like she did to Andrade. I don't feel comfortable bumping her up above Andrade, saying that that she's going to get the next shot against Valentina. Um, I think there just needs to be a little bit more work done because it was a very dominating win by Kaylin Chikagin. In fact, that was in the pre-show, I was saying the only way for Maya to get things done is, is to have that ground game, have that takedown, solidify that. Turns out Ch Caitlin Chikagin gets that done. Yeah, it's very impressive the fact that she's still able to keep on growing. But as far as getting the next shot, it's going to be a, a little harder of a leap than I think that she's she's prepared for right now against Valentina. Um, personally, man, I and I, I won't spoil the matchmaker going forward, but I think there needs to be a little bit of shuffle that happens in that top five to kind of really see the, the bad part about the women's division is they've all fought each other. You know, they're all, they've all kind of, it, it's a mix them up, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's just literally uh, like shaking up the bag and everybody reaching out, who are we fighting this time? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that's kind of, kind of where they're at as far as, unless we say, see uh, an outlier step up, but man, it's a, uh, it's a rough one for Caitlin Chikagin because she's, did, she did so well in her fight, but I'm not well enough to where I'd be able to, willing to jump her above Jessica Andrade. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And when we take a look at it one more time, man, um, this is Caitlyn Chikagian's MMA record, right? She gets the win over Maya. She has a win over Viviani Araujo, um, Cynthia Calvillo. She lost to Andrade, right? But win over Antonina Shevchenko. Two wins over Maya. Joanne Wood, Alexis Davis. Like we said, I mean, Irene Aldania, she's beat everybody that there is basically to beat except for, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go right back to it, except for, let's take a look at the, the rankings. So she hasn't beat a Lauren Murphy yet, not a Tyler Santos, not an Andrea Lee. But then again, we're di we're taking a deep dive down, you know what I mean? The uh, the top 10 right there when we're doing that, when instead we should probably be focusing on that top three, top four, whatever. My, okay, last question before we move out of this rankings review, AJ. So j even though Jessica Andrade did defeat Caitlin Chikagin in devastating fashion, right? First round, it wasn't really close. I think it was the first round. It could have been second round either way, but it was really, really close, right? Uh, I mean, really devastating, not close. 
does the frequency, the amount of wins Shukagian has picked up in that span since that fight, does that not outweigh the way that she lost last fight? Like, does the activity mean anything to you in terms of saying, all right, I'm going to bump this fighter out because they've been way more active. Jessica Andrade, on the other hand, outside of her loss to Valentina Shevchenko, she has a, uh, what, that finish win against Cynthia Calvillo, who's ranked number 10 in the division. That's the only win that she has since losing to the champ. So Shukagian has what like three wins four wins since losing to the champ three wins since losing to Andrade so does that even out for you or is it still just not really enough I mean it makes it a little bit closer for sure especially with how much uh, Kagan's grown since there like you said she has a lot of output a lot of fights especially more so than Jessica Andrade and the fact that she's getting better and better each time it definitely weighs in for me you know weighs in it weighs in a lot but then I still think about if these two are going to meet up in the cage Will will Chukagin have that advantage over Andrade going forward? Ah, it's 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 a little harder to see, especially let's say you know Jessica Andrade lands another big power shot and then we're back to square one again. Yeah. I don't think history will repeat itself exactly like that, but it definitely weighs out a little bit more for me. Yeah, yeah no, I, I understand, and that's the thing. This is kind of the point of the segment, right? Is to get a, a look into our minds on why we're moving these people where we're moving. I think it's fair to say that Caitlin Chikagin doesn't really move anywhere. She just kind of stays at number two, held down her number two spot. But that's what we talk about all the time: is when someone challenges you for your number. You got to defend it. And Chukagin did make a good point where she was saying, she's like, I don't care about fighting up or fighting down. Give me the lowest ranked opponent. Like, I don't care. And that's like the Sean O'Malley approach, right? Where he's like, what are you saying? Uncle Chell always says, take the, the, the lowest opponent on the highest spot on the card for the most money, right? That's the equation. All right, let's do it. Chukagin seems like she got it figured out. However, I will just say she uh, fought out her contract. Her contract is no longer uh, like valid with the UFC. It's expired. So she's up for renegotiations. And on the pre-fight presser, man, she was, or on the post-fight presser, she seemed just a little too uh, like, hey, I really hope the UFC resigns me. I don't know if it's going to happen. I think I deserved it, da-da-da-da-da. I think they need to resign her. I think it would be a shame to let her go to Bellator or anything like that. But uh, she felt like a little, almost too too much like, please resign me, you feel me? So, like, I don't know if there's talks in the air that she might get cut. That'd be a terrible decision. Give me a quick couple sentences on that before we move on, brother. Oh, I, I hope they don't cut her, man. Yeah. I think I do think she is one of the top fighters in the division and getting better, like I've been saying. That would be an absolute shame if they cut the blonde fighter. Absolutely. So with that being said, folks, that was our rankings review. Now we can move on to some fighter of the night, folks. This is a segment, once again, that is distinct to the Bloody Water podcast. This is not the fight of the night. The UFC already got that locked down. And speaking of that, the fight of the night was Calvin Cater versus Giga Chikadze. Performance bonuses for Jake Collier and for uh, Vyashlev Borshev, right? Your sleeper. So you called a good one on that one but fighter of the night nobody does that and the reason why is because we're taking the intangibles the storylines who had the best overall story coming into the fight did something immaculate did something incredible and at the end of the day did something worthy enough to say like listen you might not have won the fight of the night but you are legitimately the best person that stood out on this entire card you were the fighter of the night aj who is your fighter of the night for ufc vegas 46 Derek, my fighter of the night, man. I had to lead off with this one because I got to lead a little bit of crow for this fighter, my man. You know, I, I put an, I'm put going with uh, Calvin Cater. Man. He might have won fight of the night against um, Giga Chikadze, but I think he did an absolutely star-studded performance, man. And the reason I chose Calvin Cater for my fighter of the night is because I was doubting him. I was I was Giga Train all day long, man. And then Calvin Cater showed up, real, showed that he knew – what happened in that Max Holloway fight changed his, not necessarily changed his game plan, but was able to make the minor adjustments that made him grow as a fighter that much better, man. He really took a deep dive and looked into himself as a fighter and what happened in that Max Holloway fight and said, you know what, I'm doing this X, Y, and Z. I'm going to put the pressure on. I'm not going to let this dude get anywhere near the range. We're going to fight my fight. And that's really why I like Calvin Cater for this one, man. Made Giga look sloppy. Not, not Nobody. Nobody has done that since, you know, or, or two Giga um besides calvin cater man he, he literally had him like wobbly looking like that drunken master kung fu kind of style calvin cater was piecing him up with elbows it was a crazy fight and i'm not not anywhere near the way i was expecting it to go especially in an all pressure slug fest you know there was a time in second round when calvin cater had the takedown was able to absolutely dominate on the ground still surprising to me man he's growing leaps and bounds in the way he's fighting in his mental game he's super strong super mentally tough Man, Calvin Cater is a force to reckon with in the future, and that's why I'm going with him as my fighter of the night, man. He he uh, took on all the hype 
defeated one of the one of the hardest coming up of uh, fighters in the division and did it in style, man. Very impressive win for Calvin Cater. And like I said, I got to eat a lot of crow because I was doubting the homie at first, man. But this dude absolutely showed up, put on. That's why I'm making Calvin Cater my fighter of the night for UFC Vegas. Uh, what was it, 42, 46? 46, brother. I know. it's a lot. We, we get in there. A lot of numbers, you know what I'm saying? But that is a great fighter of the night to choose from. Listen, man, it was y'all must have forgot Calvin Cater edition. That just is what it is, man. I got to eat some crow, too. I'll do it a little bit later on the show. But uh, good fighter of the night, man. Mine is actually going to be the fighter that, uh, you know, got a finish right before this in the co-main event. I'm going Jake Collier as my fighter of the night, brother. And the reason why is because the prototype, <laughs> he lived up to the nickname right there, man. I don't know what exactly it is that that I know. Actually, I know what it is. It's the frame. The frame of these fighters we take a look at and we judge. And we have this prejudice. And we always say, don't judge a book by its cover. And we tell you in the pre-show, folks. We say, hey, Joe, Jake Collier, he might look a, a little round around the midsection. You feel me? But guess what? The best heavyweight champion boxer in the world is a little round around the midsection too. Tyson Fury, you feel me? So listen, Jay Collier, he has that Parker Porter type body frame, but he has the speed, the skill, the power, and everything that comes with it to be able to absolutely defeat and demolish his opponents, throw mad volume. Like I said, everything that he hits you with hurts. And he showed off a little bit of something this fight that really impressed me, which was his grappling. And if you listen to him say it himself, he says, I have never put put on a gi in my life but i am a world-class white belt and i love to hear that because as a heavyweight brother he welcomes a fight on the feet he welcomes a fight on the ground and i think that's going to take him a long way being the prototype starting off as a middleweight being five now five and five in his ufc career there's ups and downs there's trials and tribulations but one thing that he never allowed himself to do was to be down on himself, you know what I mean? To not necessarily give himself a chance to beat these tough fighters. I mean, Chase Sherman is a tough fighter and getting past Chase Sherman, finishing him in the first round, smashing nasty elbows down on his face, cutting him up bad and making him choke out. I mean, at the end of the day, man, that's an impressive uh, feather to have in your cap or, you know what I mean, notch on your belt, whatever you want to call it. And I think he has to fight one more hot prospect before he can get an actual name, man. And people are going to remember who Jake Collier is because I'll tell you, I absolutely absolutely do know the man's name and I'm not going to be forgetting it anytime soon. So for that reason, and for the big, big win over Chase, the vanilla gorilla Sherman, who is a tough outing anytime that he comes to the octagon. Jake Collier, the prototype, you are my fighter of the night, brother. Let's see it. More fireworks. I love the big boys in the heavyweight division. And AJ, man, let me just ask you, brother, is there anything more? It's just, it's that, it's, it's what makes it more special is the deceiving nature of like, you do not look like you should be able to move as fast as you move, man. Jake Collier and Parker Porter, I'm spoiling my, my matchmaking, but we have to make it happen. Am I right? What are we talking about? You're right, Derek. We got to put them against each other, man. Those dudes, and 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 like you said, Derek, the the un what the, the unassuming nature. You yeah. see a big boy, you think, oh, he can't move that fast. But if you've ever been surprised, you've never eaten a one-two from a big man. You know it comes quick, and it hurts too. It hurts, and that's exactly why I love your pick as yeah. uh, as fighter of the night, man, for uh, Jake Collier, because it was yeah. impressive, man. That dude, yeah. that dude got to it. And what I liked about the biggest thing uh, or his fight, he even said he's like, this dude throws a kick. I'm catching it. I'm putting him down. First kick that the Vanilla Gorilla threw, caught, put him down, man, stuck to the game plan, did work. Very impressive win for Collier. That's a cerebral move from a cerebral fighter, man. So that is the fighter of the night, folks. And then uh, I guess now it is time to actually do some main card recap, brother. So let's get straight into it, man. Let's not mince any words or waste any time. Senior Perfecto, man, very, very impressive showing against Joe Anderson Brito. Um, and I guess maybe we should have saw this coming a little bit with the flow style of a Bill Algeo. But I guess when you're just nonstop forward on the train tracks, no mixing it up, no feigns, you're just nonstop relentless going forward it's not and i'm not going to say it's easy but it's not the most difficult thing to game plan against and bill algio seemed like he just let brito tire himself out and then kind of work his grappling work his striking a little bit um what was interesting to me though was that brito was bringing him on the feet and he was kind of piecing algio up a little bit man having a little more success on the feet than he was on the ground it was it surprising to you that Brito wasn't able to just grab Algeo, hold him down like he's basically done to everybody else. I mean, listen, I think it was 10 of his 11 wins was via finish or something like that. What do you think? 
Yeah, it was, especially I was expecting it to happen in the first. I was yeah. expecting Brito to be able to hold uh, Algeo down in the first and not, man. He, but Algeo was able to weather that storm. And then once the power and that, that, uh, that you know, Algeo, or Brito started kind of gassing himself out, I really started to see the, the beginning of the end, man, because those punches were a little labored. They were connecting. You know, uh, Brito was lining up Algeo. He was connecting, but it just didn't have the pop, didn't have that power. He didn't ever have, Algeo never had that look of like, oh, shit, this dude tagged me one in his face you know he was still able to stay with it stay calm stay composed and stay confident too man i really liked it i was very surprised that uh brito even because he had him deep against the cage at certain points wasn't able to you know um what's the word i'm looking for uh take advantage of his positioning yeah yeah absolutely man and i thought bill algeo was gonna have to do a lot of defensive grappling um but it wasn't even really that man it was just stuffing the takedown staying composed and like i said letting brito gas himself out which is such a savvy veteran move but i wanted to just take a look really quickly aj at the uh, at the stats that we have here for this matchup right so for bill algeo we see it in the first round he outstrikes um let's go significant strikes actually he outstrikes uh Brito, three to one, man. So not, not really a lot happened in that first round, right? We had some takedown attempts, all that good stuff, right? Um, we're looking at three of eight in round two. Or what am I looking at, man? Is that the body? What am I looking at? Okay, there we go. All right, sorry about this, folks. Significant strike, 64%, 11 of seven. Okay, there we go. 11 to two in the first round, 19 to 16 in the second round, and then 29 to 22 in the third round. So basically, he had a steady amount of volume, man. He was out striking them everywhere, every round. It was what it was. When we're looking at takedown attempts, I did think it was interesting because Algeo was two of two for his own takedown attempts. Brito was two of four. So 50% takedown, you know, defense for Brito, 100% for Algeo. Or not 100%, 50%. I don't know, AJ. You see, when I start talking stats, things start getting weird. I start forgetting what the hell, where I'm at. I, 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 you know what I mean, dissociate a little bit, brother. The point that we have here, man, is Bill Algeo put on a hell of a performance, and it was something to, uh, to behold, man. Even though he passed a tough test, I think he has tougher tests on the horizon for him because he has earned a potential name with this win. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, man. Especially if, if you're able to shut down a pressure machine like Joe, uh, Joe Anderson Brito, it's one of the hardest things to do to be able to keep that gas tank, keep your head, you know, solid and keep thinking, okay, I got to do this X, Y, and Z, because this dude's going to keep bringing it forward. Mr. Perfecto showed a hell of a game plan going forward, man, and absolutely to put put like the the perfect game plan in place for Brito, man. Having him gas himself out like that, like you said, is a very savvy veteran move. And if it didn't work out, if Brito was able to have that gas tank, it could have been a very different fight. But luckily for Algeo, man, he played it cool. He played it calm, picked his spots, chose the right ones to attack, and when to not. Had a very good game plan going. You know, before you were talking about the numbers, the 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 numbers get a little a little hard once you start really diving into them. But just the performance aspect that Brito had, where he was able to take everything that was coming, turn it around, and make it better for himself, that's what kind of impressed me most. And I agree, man. I think he's going to have a big name coming forward in his next fight. It's going to make a lot of fun for the future. He even called out Giga at the end, so you know this dude's planning in advance, man. It was funny, man. He says, are there any Giga fans in here? They're like, yeah. He's like, go home. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. All right, all right, bro. So it is interesting. Bill Algeo actually has alternated wins um, back and forth since 2019. That's the last time he had a win streak. So hopefully he can put together a nice little streak. But I'll tell you what, a win over Brito is definitely uh, heading in the right direction. So big win for Senior Perfecto. Uh, you'd love to see it, man. You'd love to see it. Next win right here, man. This was your sleeper. But uh, Vyashlev Borishev, he gets the first round knockout with a liver shot against Dakota Bush. And I'll tell you what, Dakota Bush was bringing it in that first round. But when it comes to striking, when it comes to pure striking, uh, Borshev, I think he's just a little bit too advanced, even though he's a newcomer in the UFC. But what was interesting is what I thought would happen, man. Dakota Bush tried to initiate some grappling for Borshev. And uh, Borshev was able to get up. But were you were you a little worried for a minute? You know what I mean? Picking Borshev and seeing that he was kind of getting smothered on the ground. I was like, uh oh. I was like, is this another UFC veteran? Just being, and Dakota Bush isn't. I mean, now he's one and one, or 0 oh and 2, excuse me, in the UFC. But but the point is, is he got that experience. I was like, is he about to just smash him on the ground and not let him get up, nullify the striking completely? Were you a little worried at times? I was a little worried, Derek, because Dakota Bush was looking good against the kickboxer, man. He was, the strikes were looking good. He was looking fast. He had that takedown. And, but uh, what was nice is you you could tell that Slava has been working on uh, the ground game with um, Alpha Male. You know they've been putting him in those situations because he knew exactly what to do, man. He kicked off right perfect, put the hips, or feet on the hips, 
kicked off, was able to get things going. But what I like, too, is the fact that Dakota Bush, once he rushed in again for the attempt, uh, Slava was able to turn him around, use that momentum, flip him around, get on top. Very impressive. I was I was not going to lie to you, though, Derek. I was very nervous at the beginning, man, because I had Dakota Bush winning that first the first round up until he got hit with that dirty left hook to the body. Yeah. I had him as the winner, you know, as the advancer, as the guy with the more points going forward. But dude, that you you eat one of those left hooks to the body, it's 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 lights out, you know. Absolutely, and Dakota Bush is kind of the same uh, type of performance he put on against Austin Hubbard in his last fight, where he just came out balls to the wall in the first round, and ended up gassing himself out. So I hope that wasn't gonna, what was going to take place here. Maybe his cardio was a little bit better than that, but uh, that heavy pressure approach, man, is just something to behold. And I just wanted to take a look real fast. I um, mean, we're looking on the ESPN stats right here, man. Um, one knockdown for Borshev, obviously, but he outstruck him 17 to 11 in total strikes when we're talking about uh, body shots five for five for uh slava claws man so that's something that's you know always interesting to see when he got that five for five perfect on the body shots he just knows how to dig it and land it every time man but the big figure to take away is the minute and 30 seconds of control time dakota bush racked up in that first round so that's kind of what i'm talking about man like he did the right thing. He tried to keep the fight on the ground. He tried to sit there and nullify the offense of Borshev. But he's such a dangerous opponent, man. The fighter hailing out of Russia, who uh, is representing Team Alpha Male, even though Uriah Faber wasn't in his corner because Uriah Faber got COVID, so he wasn't able to be in his corner. It was a big win for Borshev. Um, bright things in the future for this man. Am I right? Like, come on, man. Let, let's talk about it real fast. Quick prediction. Obviously, Dakota Bush, look, 185 in the division. Borishev, when I checked on Tapology last, he moved up to actually number 105 in the lightweight division in terms of just MMA fighters and stuff like that. But my question to you, man, is we have so many of these good prospects here. This is the lightweight division, though, brother. So let's not forget. How quickly, how quick of a rise can you see Borishev taking up this division, man? Is he going to take the Matus Gamrot approach where, I mean, it only took a couple fights before. It's like we're talking ranking. We're talking, you know doing this he got the win over jeremy stevens that catapulted him up to up there how quick of a, of a timeline are you thinking for borshev to really advance man i'm thinking we're gonna see him fight like five times within the next you know year year and a half and then we'll really start talking about uh you know uh, rankings and number 10 i could see it five fights till he's in the top 10 to be honest with you man he's he's a very very talented fighter but he has enough in the tank or enough um experience in the bag that he knows okay i can't just jump right to number six and then and then you know get put out and then that's the the end of my reign the end of my fire going for the ufc i think he's smart enough to know that he's gonna have to take a couple you know get get there the slow route this the the steady way so that way he's there for a long time i think slava is gonna uh, go at least that route man that's what i hope for the man anyway but the the matchmakers might have it another way and they might just throw yeah. him to the dogs and then he performs and then you're in the you're in the game so i mean personally i think it's going to be about five fights to we're seeing him in that top 10 top 15 area what yeah. about you well, well, something you had noted, uh, you had noted in the pre-show, kind of stood out to me. And you said that he went to Team Alpha Male and said, "Hey, like I'm going to be." What'd you say? He's like, "I'm going to be a UFC fighter or something like that." Is that something sound right? Yep. Yeah, so to have that self-confidence and that self-belief just tells me that you're probably going to go pretty far if you have true self-confidence and belief in yourself. And you don't care about the naysayers. You just know, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I just know it's going to happen. So if he can take that mentality, man and keep applying it to the UFC, this was his fourth finish win in a row. And it helps to get a 50K bonus and to get a finish in your UFC debut, right? So I just think that Borshev, even though he has a, a wacky name that you, you know what I mean, for us American folks, it's kind of tough to pronounce. I think he can be a real draw, brother. You know what I mean? He's over there doing the, what do you call that little dance that he does at the end? But I don't even know what it is. But Slava Claus, brother, it's a great nickname. I think that it's going to be able to roll off the tongue well. And he's going to enter that stable of prospect fighters that you have to watch every time that they fight. But this was a big win, man. Can't take anything away uh, from Dakota Bush because not many people can eat a liver shot like that and keep standing. You know what I mean? Maybe Calvin Cater is the only man that can because his body was tore up in that first round against Giga. But... Not, it's neither here nor there. Um, all right, brother. Caitlin Chikagian, blonde fighter, gets the unanimous decision win in her rematch against Jennifer Maya. And uh, listen, this is kind of what we were saying, man. This was rinse, wash, repeat. I did notice this fight was a little scrappier. And I do got to give props to Jennifer Maya, man. She is a dog. Like, you know what I mean? She brings it, brother. And she got that power in them hands. But Caitlin Chikagian said, I'm going to assert my dominance. And how I'm going to do that? I'm going to outstrike you on the feet. Then I'm going to take you down. And I'm going to have the top control on you. So let's take a look at the numbers real fast, man. Caitlin Chikagian, she outstrikes Jennifer Maya 
at 81 to 60 in total strikes, 72 to 52 in significant strikes. Beat up the body a bit, man. 21 shots to the body, only five for Maya, 44 to the head for Chukagian, 31 for Maya. But what was interesting is the control time and the takedowns. Three minutes and 34 seconds of control time for Caitlin Chukagian, one of four for takedowns. 0 oh, and 2 takedowns for Jennifer Maya, man. So once again, this was what we said was the game plan going into it. If you're Jennifer Maya, you must focus on the takedowns. And was it surprising to you to see that she wasn't just relentlessly going for shots? Like, did that surprise you at all? Yeah, man. So it surprised me like crazy. I was expecting that to be the approach for Jennifer Maya. Yeah. And what surprised me more was the fact that uh, when, when Kaylin Chikagan saw her aspects, then yeah, she was yeah. relentless on the takedown and, and staying, keeping that, like you said, three and a half minutes of, of ground control. I expected those numbers to be flipped completely. Mm -hmm. But, you know, interesting. And like I said, Kaylin Chikagan's growing, man. Can't, yeah. can't hold it against her. Absolutely. But the question becomes here, man, when you know what your strength is and you know you're a jiu-jitsu practitioner and you know that, like, that was the game plan you had against Valentina, hold her down and do this. You should have taken the same approach. But sometimes it makes me wonder in these rematch fights if maybe it's an ego thing. And they said, man, uh, something was just wrong last time. I'm just going to come out and I'm going to outstrike her. And I'm going to do, you know, because Jennifer Maya, she has good striking, man. She knows how to land that one, two. It just lands at a constant clip. Jukagian, man, her eye was reddened up even in that first round. Like, if you look at the head strikes, I mean, 31 for 143 for Maya, it's not the greatest accuracy clip, man. But she was still landing. Like, watching the fight and looking at the numbers, it looks a little bit different, man. But Jennifer Maya was landing. You have to give her her respect. In terms of Caitlin Chikagian, though, man, um, in terms of the increase in skill, like you said, she's improving, she's getting better. How dangerous does it make her if she really gets that grappling honed down, man? I'm pretty sure she trains at like Henzo Gracie Jiu Jitsu or something like that. But the point is, is uh, if she could take down a Jennifer Maya and hold her there, that's a scary prospect for all the other girls in the division, man, because you not only have a striker who can put it on you from range, has those long arms, but if she can grapple you up, there's not much you can do against the blonde fighter. What do you think? Yeah, man, makes her very dangerous going forward in the future. That's kind of the big hole that everybody sees in her game. You know, it, it's, we were even talking about it with the Maya fight. If Maya can get her down to the ground and hold her there, it's going to be a, an easier path to victory for Jennifer Maya. Turns out that Caitlin Shkagan thought the exact same thing and said, yeah, you ain't holding me down. I'm going to hold you down. I'm putting it to you like this. Very, very tactful approach by uh, Caitlin Chukagan going there, man. Because anytime you we see it all the time with uh, whatever fighters you're talking about, it's a striker. Oh, okay, we're putting up against a uh, a, a grappler and uh, you know a ground game sp uh, specialist. Caitlin Chukagan saw that exact thing happening to her, and she says, "Yeah, I got it. Like I, I know that I know what to do now." Very cerebral from Chukagian, the fact that she was able to switch that and know that's what's coming. So she's able to put that person there because we talk about it all the time, man. The way to the way to beat a bully is to be the bully. Same thing with this one. The way the, to beat the ground game specialist is to be that ground game specialist and actually put it to Jennifer Maya. If Caitlin Chukagian can keep this up and keep it growing, man, she's going to be very dangerous for Valentina coming forward. I mean, and that's, uh, you know, it's all speculation there because Valentina is so high, you know, so high in the talent pool. Yeah. But Caitlin Chukagian is catching up, man. I have a prediction real fast, man. This is just like an off-the-cuff prediction. What would, you, what would you say that Valentina says, you know, with this new found Juliana Payne in the bantamweight division, she says, I'm moving up. I'm going for the double champ status, right? And then maybe she, you know, focuses on bantamweight a little bit. Maybe she foregoes flyweight and Caitlin Chikagian steps in when there's some placeholder, some vacancy interim champion, women's flyweight. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. It might happen. These are the opportunities that can arise when, you know, things in the division start shaking up. That's neither here nor there, man. Very impressive. And I and just the grappling and her being the bully and the grappling just reminds me of Adrian Yanez where he says, like, nah, bro, like, I, I don't get knocked out. I do the knocking out, right? That is Chukagian. Like, I, I don't get out grappled. I do the out grappling. Ever since that uh, crucifix loss to Jessica or uh, to Valentina Shevchenko, you definitely have to think she's like, I'm never letting that happen again. You'd have to imagine, right? Um, all right, brother. So we take that one down and move on to this Brandon Roy Val, Hogerio Bontarine, very controversial fight, though it ended up in the right, right hand, the, the right victor one very controversial brother and i'm just gonna pull up the photo again just because look at it man Orival got that arm bar locked in bontarine ghost tap that's neither here nor there i want to ask you uh, a question right here man this felt like a story of oh pulled the wrong one down my fault this looked like a story of volume and output versus power and strength and control time so 
what counts more to you, man? When we take a look at the numbers, we have Brandon Roy Val. He lands 81 out of 174 total strikes to 39 uh, for 71 for Bontarin. So clearly outstruck the man, like by far. 40 significant strikes for uh, Roy Val, 28 for Bontarin. But the question that we have here is that when Roy Val landed on Bontarin, it felt like it did nothing. When Bontarin landed on Roy Val, he's knocking them all over the cage. And Roy Val said it in the post fight press. He says, those shots didn't do anything to me it's just my balance but i'm like i hear you but it just doesn't look good like it doesn't look good optically in the eyes of the judges regardless of it's your balance or not you're getting kind of knocked all over the cage now the one thing to take into account here is that yes when we're talking striking numbers roy val got that if we're talking about control time seven minutes and 41 seconds to a minute and 43 for brandon roy val eight of nine takedowns for bontarin no takedowns for roy val so that's where that's where my question lies does the output and the volume of a roy val where it was a little flashier a little more da 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 Da, 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 right versus that power of monitoring the few and far in between the power at the takedown and, and the control what what's more impactful to you brother obviously Roy Val got the win but if you were judging the fight did you see this clearly as a win for Brandon Roy Val given the way that the, the fight kind of played out man I had it even going into the third I had it very close because normally I'm all about the damage I'm if you're putting damage on and you, you know maybe not uh Bontarine didn't actually hurt Roy Vol, but the fact that he's able to spin him around like look like like you said he's making him off balance taking that balance away that's a force aspect man you don't take somebody's balance away just by jabbing them in the face you gotta have a real hard jab that actually snaps their head back that they you know he get a little unbalanced I usually lead towards damage, man, personally. But to that same aspect, you have somebody who's piecing you up. You know, you you throw one punch that hurts them or lands and, you know, rocks them a little bit and they hit you back with 35. It's a little <laughs> it's a little unbalanced in the fact that, the you know, the, the striking acumen goes a little bit more towards Roy Vall in this instance. Personally, like I said, I lead it. I, I favor a damage a little bit more, but that's a kind of a um, – a teeter totter of a balance like which which yeah. way does it go when you have that one if you can't put him out with that one shot then kind of the accumulation matters a little bit more to me yeah no i hear you man because i had it the same way i had a one one going into round three and i thought brandon roy val just did what he needed to do to win the fight not only the submission attempt that was basically he he <laughs> He tapped Bontarine, you know what I mean? But on top of that, he held Bontarine down. And when, uh, you know, he was on bottom or on top or whatnot, he was or he was on top and he was just throwing down vicious ground and pound elbows, everything, just being active. He won the round three, and I think he won the fight. But if he did not have that effort in round three, man, and like, listen, Bontarine had a case to win the fight. Now, when people are saying robbery, I don't agree. I don't think this was a robbery whatsoever. It was a close fight, you know? But... Now let's talk about it in depth, brother. Morality. Is there such thing in this sport, my man? You know, let, let me single myself. Let me go on a rant. Is there such thing as morality in this sport? Is there such thing as is, is a true uh, reminder of, of what this sport is about, which is your pride, your ego, all that good stuff, man, but your honor. That's, that's really what it is, man. You must have honor in this sport. And if we're talking if we're being honest about it man if you go back and you watch the ufc one ufc one or ufc two ufc three and you're watching uh hoist gracie you know over here submitting these huge dudes whatnot you'll notice that he holds on to submissions for a long time why not because he's an asshole but because these dudes would tap and then be like oh no i didn't tap whatever and the ref didn't see it so he was forced to be like okay if I get you an armbar, I'm going to break your arm, literally, so that there is, there's all the evidence in the world, you tap, that's it, you're done. The referee needs to stop it, I'm not going to stop. So the last thing that you want is to revert back to that and having dude hold submissions even when dudes tap, just so the referee makes sure that they do their job and they step in. But uh, when we're talking about honor, man, I lost a little bit of respect for Bontarine. I still think he's an amazing fighter, great fighter, but I lose a little bit of respect when you do the you do the ghost tap. And, uh, you know, I just want to see if he's going to comment on it if he what he's gonna say about it he didn't have a post-fight interview from what i saw but just give me give me your take on this not not just as an analyst of the fight game man but just as a fight fan like what what does this do to you in respect for uh you know your opinion of hojirio bontarin yeah it's uh it's hard man because there, there's many a way where you could have framed it the fact that he didn't tap you know it was a closed fist he's just trying to like elbow or something and it looks like that way it was very clearly uh one of those panic like oh shit oh shit my arm my arm like let go um 
I wouldn't say necessarily lost a little bit of respect. Any while you were explaining your bit, Derek, it always made me think of this one time we were playing back home. You know, it was uh, we were getting ready for a three on three tournament. It was called the Gus Macker back home, um, and we were playing at the park. We were playing ball at the park. And one of the, like, I happened to touch the ball as it goes out. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that was me. Like, my bad. You know, it's all good. But we weren't playing for, you know, uh, we weren't playing the tournament yet. So, yeah. sure enough, the tournament comes around. I'm not going to be announcing that kind of stuff. That's yeah. the, you know, the ref calls it. The way the ref calls it is what it is. A little bit. Is, is it a little bit dirty of a play? Yeah, sort of. But I would I expect the other team to do the same thing? Yeah, 100%. Now, in the fact of a tap, it's a little bit more dirty or a little bit uh, uh cheekier of a way because i definitely don't have the same i didn't i didn't lose any respect but i didn't feel the same way of uh bontarine as i do now you know what i'm saying like there, there's something gone right there because it's it's a it's an admission you know if you're tapping you know it's an admission of damn you got me like please like let go and not not so much of like a uh I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify it as close as to like a fence grab or something like that, but it's a, a lot of, not necessarily lost uh, respect, but there, there was something missing there. Once I saw it go down and then he kept fighting, it's, it's, it's a little bit of an honor thing for sure. Well, maybe I used the wrong words. I did not lose respect for Bontarina as a fighter, but uh, kind of in that Priscilla Cachoeira, you know what I mean, style of like, all right, are you going for the eyes? Like, why are you being dirty? Like, come on. You know what I mean? Like, yes, you're a great fighter, but come on. Don't do that, you know? <laughs> so it's just because it reminds me, it's the same thing at the gym, brother. You know, you get somebody in a rear naked choke or a guillotine, they start gurgling a little bit. So you're like, yo, are you okay? And they're like, oh, dude, I'm fine. It's like, you weren't fine. You know you weren't fine, but it's okay. You know what I mean? That's it. I just think honor is an important thing and uh, like you said you know obviously in a pickup game when you're playing for nothing yeah of course that was me whatever you can have the ball you know ball don't lie but you know playing for money playing for a championship referee that was you ain't say nothing man so i ain't touch it you feel me so i get it if you're not cheating you're not trying big win for brandon roy Val at the end of the day very emotional in his po a post fight presser he definitely needed a win because he was on a two fight losing streak uh but nonetheless man i just think that this is the flyweight division is on fire right now man this is basically as exciting as it's ever been so it'll be fun to see you know future matchups and all that good stuff man okay folks one more reminder before we move on if you haven't got your merch go get your merch bloodywaterpodcast.com you can hit us up at the website bloodywaterpodcast.com once again hit up the merchandise tab all that good stuff code bwp10 for 10 percent off all purchases at checkout once again drop a like subscribe hit us up on instagram at uh bloody water podcast and on twitter at bloody water pod and like I said, man, I don't, I don't know how many times to phrase it, but anything you're looking for, you can find it at the website. I'll just leave it there. Drop a like, subscribe. You dig. All right, AJ, co-main event, Jake Collier versus Chase Sherman, man. And this is, uh, I didn't see this fight ending by submission. Uh, admittedly to, uh, you know, in the post fight presser, Jake Collier didn't see it ending by submission either. He thought this was going to be a fight of the night banger, as I think we all kind of did. But here's the thing, man. When you're a mixed martial artist, sometimes it jumps out of you. Like you said earlier, right? He told his coach, if he throws that kick, I'm catching it. And when you got a big boy that's 264 pounds that has to cut weight to heavyweight and he gets you in full mount, it's going to be a tough time getting him off of you, especially when he has the ability to drop elbows on your face and ground and pound down. And it just seemed like that 15 pounds that Chase Sherman gave up for Collier made the, all the difference when it came down to the grappling here. Now, on the feet... Jake Collier, man, like I said, he's a stud, dude. He's super duper fast, man. And uh, let's take a look at the numbers one more time, man. For Jake Collier, 20 total strikes to 10 for Sherman. 20, all 20 were significant, I suppose. All 10 for Sherman were, you know, significant. But look at that damage on the face, man. That was just, you know, Collier putting it on him, man. And really not much to say in terms of the numbers. But uh, Collier did his job, and, and he got Sherman out of there. Now, the sad thing about this is I told you, the loser of this fight might get the boot from the UFC. And it's sad to see because Chase Sherman is now, I believe, like 1-3 in three or 1-4 in, um, in his UFC comeback. This is kind of his, his new comeback to the UFC. So... Always love to see the vanilla gorilla fight. He always brings it, man. But this is Jake Collier's day. So what do you have to say on this matchup, brother? Man, the uh, the elbows of Jake yeah. Collier, what I think kind of did it in. I think I think uh, Chase Sherman, you know, felt a little confident on the feet. The hands were flying. Everything was good. But the second he got taken down, eight, like two elbows. That's when it got to the, the beginning of the end. Yeah. You saw Sherman turn his back. And kind of, uh, you know, like you said, when you're in MMA, you see the, the opportunity present itself. Of course, you're going to take it. Yeah. Of course, you're going to take that opportunity. Very impressive win for Collier. Homeboy is quick. I had I thought Sherman had the power, to be completely honest with you. I thought Sherman had a little bit of power advantage going in, and then we saw that happen. And no, nope, not at all, man. Collier is thick. He was dropping bombs. 
didn't see it going by submission, but it was yeah. a quick fight. And when it, the opportunity presents itself, you you attack that neck. Absolutely. And that's kind of just what I was saying. I was like, Collier, man, he's fast, he's quick, but the snap on his shots, man, it's like all of it put together. He's just so deceiving. Because when you're 265 and you can move like that, you have to imagine everything hurts. Everything hurts. Your hands are just heavy. Like everything hurts. So shout out to the prototype, Jake Collier, man. I think that this is a definitely a step in the right direction. Give you another good matchup until you get a big name or ready to fight one of those OG veterans. I mean, he called out Andre Arlovsky. He was like, what's up, man? Sherman and y'all went to a decision. I just starched him. Let's fight, old man. Let's do it. Or Justin Taffa. So we'll talk matchmaking in a second, man. He said, it'd be nice if the man could make weight. You feel me? What's up, big boy? Let's get it. So a little bit of call out there, man. But uh, all right, brother. So this is what it comes down to, man. Man. The main event, Calvin Cater absolutely demolished Giga, G, uh, Giga Chikadze, excuse me. However, it was closer than one may have imagined because I had to watch these fight backs. I didn't watch them in, in real time. So when I saw 50 45 Calvin Cater, I was like, what? And what? What happened? You know what I mean? But when you watch the fight back, this was very reminiscent to Calvin Cater, Max Holloway, to where it was close. But Cater was winning all the rounds. But it was close, you know what I mean? It's not like Chikade did nothing, you know what I mean? Um, but I got a couple of pictures that I need to put up. And the first one is this one, man. This is just something that you don't really expect to see. However, it is interesting because I think this was at the, towards the end of the fight. This was like, you know what I mean, last 10, 15 seconds or something like that. And uh, you see a bloodied up Giga Chikade for those who are listening. Calvin Cater standing over him, getting ready to drop some bombs. But this is actually something that I wanted to talk about, AJ. Calvin Cater did something that Edson Barbosa didn't do in his fight with Giga Chikaze, which was in that first round, he says, I'm not only going to push the pressure on the feet, I'm going to grapple with you a little bit. I'm going to wrestle with you. I'm going to hold you down. I'm going to I'm gonna get some blood flowing through those arms, you know what I mean? Get that lactic acid built up. Get you a little tired, you know? And I'm going to have you on the back foot the entire fight. I think that definitely played a role when it comes to zapping out that gas tank because when it came to round two, round three, Giga was looking a little gassed. But my question off the bat to you, AJ, is did you notice in the first round, Giga Chikadze came out and he looked stiff to me. He was really quick. Everything was bah, 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 like he was landing a body shot, shot, one, two. But everything felt so tight and stiff. And I was like, bro, you feel like you're like to me, I was like, it felt like you're exerting a lot of energy right now. And you're not flowing. You're just being you're forcing it. You're landing, but you're forcing it. And against Cater, it's a, it's a tough man to do that against. So what, what do you think? Do you agree? What, what, what's your take on that? Oh, one hundred percent, Derek. He he didn't. He looked stiff. I, that, that was a good way to phrase it because he really. I was looking back at the, this fight and I was comparing it to that uh, that Jamey Simmons KO that he has, where where he was in his flow state. You know, Giga was in a flow state. He can see the strikes coming. The, the kicks are snappy. He's able to maintain that range. Here, everything looked forced, man. Every everything was stiff. Everything they were landing, sure, but they weren't landing with the same kind of fluidity and that snap that really hurts at the end of the punches. Uh, it was it was it was interesting to see because it was definitely felt like Cater's night. You know, you've ever, if you've ever been in there, you're ever like kind of feeling the one where it's just not your night. Not thing, things aren't going exactly like it is. That's kind of how it felt with Giga, man. It, it felt like just it wasn't flowing correctly. The the stars weren't aligned for him to be at his top performance. He didn't peak that night. Might have peaked, you know, today, tomorrow, whenever it was. Um, but it definitely felt strained. It didn't, it didn't feel like his kind of uh, his his night exactly his style of fight. But he was still landing. He was still doing good. But once that second round came around and Calvin Cater was able to hold him down the entire time, that's when I knew. I was like, okay, this is going to be a real rough fight for Giga. Hands started getting low. Body posture started getting low. He was eating more elbows right up the middle. And you could tell it always hurt to, or you could tell the ones that always hurt the fighter when he starts trying to throw that back. You know, yeah, uh, Calvin Cater hit him with a couple elbows. And he's like, oh, elbow, okay. Like, I'm, I'm getting you one of these. But you know, that's like, oh, it's, that's because that one hurt. Yeah, and it goes to show that's when you start not fighting the way you're supposed to fight, but fighting emotionally because you never try to get one back. You know what I mean? You go and you reset, and you, and you know your moment will come. But this was just a showcase win for Calvin Cater, man. This was a, um, and I said I got to eat some crow, so this is the time to eat some crow, man. For Calvin Cater, brother, it just goes to show like he is on another echelon. He is on another rank, another level in this featherweight division when it comes down to pure striking and mixing in that MMA. Now, was it a little bit of a, the perfect opponent with Giga Chikai? in hindsight now yes because giga doesn't shoot on you you know what i mean there's no grappling coming from giga unless it's like that rare opportunity i'm going to jump in and i'm going to go for a submission other than that it was him on the back foot using that karate style and one thing that i noticed here is that calvin cater's boxing efficiency and the way that he fights I just think that was so, it was just a little more optimal in this matchup than Giga Chikadze's karate style, AJ. And do you feel what I'm saying? Because if you noticed, Cater was able to walk forward, 
granted, Chin weaponizes, Chin weaponizes cardio, but keep Giga on the back foot, and he was just popping out that jab, popping out that jab, maybe a calf kick from time to time, shovel to the body, whatever, but Giga Chikadze, every time that he's throwing, he's doing the karate style striking, where it's that, bah, bah, where your whole body is moving, you know, you're throwing the one-twos, it's not the fluid boxing, you know, it's not that, but it's that kind of just like whole body into a karate style, throw the liver kick, everything is going, your whole body is shifting with every movement, constantly orthodox, constantly southpaw, so did you notice like the the level of efficiency between a Calvin Cater and a Giga Chikadze where I felt like give it another five rounds and Cater could have been basically doing the same thing. You give it another five rounds for Giga and he might have been passed out on the floor, even though I do want to say we need a sponsorship for like can't hurt me fighter of the night or whatever. If David Goggins didn't have that, I would love it because Cater looked like a defeated man on the stool. And every time he rose to the occasion, dug deep, found those demons and said, fuck it, we're going, brother. So that was so impressive. Give me your take. Yeah, I think so. Those, those long karate strikes, they, they look flashy and they hurt when you catch somebody on the end of the punches and the kicks. But as far as efficiency and as far as, you know, you dealing out that gas tank, definitely Cater's kind of style of fight, man. He's real smooth, real going. And honestly, I was expecting a lot more calf kicks coming from Giga. Attack that front leg, attack, you know, keep it going. But because we all knew Cater was going to be on the front foot in that boxing range like he prefers, and Chikadze just wasn't able to have that um fluidity or have that precise technique to be able to get it in there calvin was just way too close right where he needed to be and i agree with you that long style of karate striking that uh, chikaze is so dangerous at calvin had the exact per, uh, perfect game plan to be able to combat that going forward yeah. not allowing that striking that distance to be an issue where he was able to weaponize his pace and like you said weaponize his chin man nothing more demoralizing when you put all you have into a guy you get him one solid on the chin you think it's gonna hurt him and he's just staring in the, right back at you laughing that's a that's a hell of an ego killer right there. Absolutely, brother. So it was it was very impressive because it looked like nothing Giga gave to uh, to uh, Cater faced him whatsoever. But Cater, those shots, it looked like they you know Chikaze was wearing it after a while, man. But this was, was what was interesting to me is that the the kick approach. I agree with you. I was like, why are, why is Giga not kicking more? Where are the leg kicks? We've seen Cater have issues with leg kicks in the past because he's so heavy on the front foot. But the reason is clear. It's because. Cater smothered Chikadze. He smothered the kicking range. He says, if you're going to do work, you're doing work with your hands. And I know that I'm a better boxer, so I'll take that fight all day. If I can eliminate the giga kick, if I can eliminate all that, I'm basically in, in, in a comfortable spot. Now, what's interesting is that Cater ate a bunch of body shots, man. His body was reddened up. You feel me? I mean, when, let's take a look at the numbers real fast, brother. Look at Cater. Look at just like the, the figure. If you're watching, um, you could see the redness all over Cater. The redness is basically body and head. The redness is for, you know, basically the head on Giga. The body is a little bit light. And for those who are listening at home, that's just an indication of the amount of damage that was done. So when we look at body shots, 13 body shots for Cater, which is a little surprising, 27 for Giga, 127 to the head for Cater. 94 for Giga. When we're looking at significant strikes, 144 edge to 128 in favor of Calvin Cater. Only one knockdown, two of seven for his takedowns. So with all that being said, now that we've gone over those numbers, it was still a very close fight. But Cater, man, that just that head hunting nature, man. I'm surprised he didn't dig to the body a little bit more, but that head hunting nature got the job done for Giga, even though it was more balanced body and head, man. Cater just walked through everything. So do you agree that if, when you're on the back foot, and this is something I know from experience, man, when you're sparring and someone just has you on the back foot the whole time, it's so tiring and you don't have the same pop on your shots. There's very few fighters who can work off the back foot and have massive power, but the power comes from precision and accuracy and timing, not from pure power. So like an Izzy Adesanya. He moved backwards, but he could tag you with that one shot, and that's it, right? Giga Chikadze generally can do that, but when Cater is just constantly in your face, what's up, bro? Nose smashed in, just wiping off his nose. Like, what's up? You know, when you have that, it's just a, it's a hard battle to overcome. And I think that my prediction for Bill Algeo for Joe Anderson Brito was more on point for this fight than it was for that one. Because I said, if Brito can stop the flow of Algeo, man, it's going to be real tough for him to do anything. That's what Cater did to Chikadze, in my opinion, man. So uh, what's your rebuttal on that one, brother? Yeah, no re no rebuttal, man. I agree <laughs> with you. It's it's real hard to, to keep to your game plan, yeah. especially coming from a karate background like I do, man. If somebody is bull rushing you the entire time and you can't get off that center line and crack them one time to make them think about it again – yeah, it's hard, man. That timing is everything when you're trying to land the shots at the end of your, you know, the, the pop at the end of your shots. Um, yeah, Calvin Cater, man, very impressive win.
Absolutely. Excuse me. So what does this mean for Calvin Cater at this point, man? Um, it's something that I asked in the beginning. How good is Max Holloway? Like, how, how good is he? Right? Yeah, man. No, this shows not only does it show how good Max Holloway is, but it also to me shows how good Calvin Cater saw Max Holloway was and says, I need to level up. I need yeah. to level up my game and fight my game. Very like, dude, I, I get like, it's, it's crazy to see how different the two fights were that Calvin yeah. Cater just had going from getting bullied on getting basically picked on and embarrassed in front of the whole school to now doing that to the next guy up and coming. Very impressive and showed that Calvin Cater is smart, man. He knows how to take the game plan and actually grow as a fighter and yeah. keep on rolling. Do you agree or not do you agree? Do you uh, uh, believe in in the in the thing that is called the rub, right? You know what I mean? Do you think that Max Holloway gave Calvin Cater the rub the same way that Max Holloway gave Brian Ortega the rub? Or is it was that the fight? Yeah, I think Max Holloway blessed both of them, you feel me? And it gave them that rub that that they needed to move to that next step. Because that's what they were saying in the commentary. They're like, Chikadze, what's scary is that he's just going to get better after this fight. And that's the same thing. I mean, Cater was on that run, ran into Holloway, and then now look at what he did. It's just like, oh, you're a scary fighter, dude. Same thing for Brian Holloway. So do you believe in the rub, and do you think G Giga Chikadze is going to come back stronger than ever after this? Yeah, oh, 100%, I believe in the rub, man. You, yeah. you have to have those old dudes show you kind of what's up, yeah. show you that, that little bit of game, that little bit of experience for you to be like, oh, okay, this is where, because they've all had that exact same thing in their, in their own career. You know, Max Holloway had it done to him, and then he learns from it, keeps on going. Same thing, I think, man, Giga, especially from a fight like this where it's a real demoralizing kind of a long five rounds, you're getting beat up in your mind. You know, you're thinking that stuff the whole time too, man. You're in your mind while this dude's piecing you up in the face. So I think this is one of those wins that Giga, or one of those losses, excuse me, that Giga has that's going to make him learn from it. You know, not a loss, a lesson, but he's going to keep on growing. I definitely believe in the rub for sure. Absolutely. And this is, I don't want to, listen, apples to oranges, but when Mayweather fought Canelo and just outclassed him over the course of 12 rounds, and then we saw what Canelo has become, sometimes that's what you need. You need that one step back to jump three, four <laughs> steps forward. Bright future for Giga Chikadze, but hey, Calvin Cater has now firmly re-entered title contention or potentially setting up another rematch for Max Holloway. At this point, he's kind of in a little bit of a limbo himself, given that uh, he hasn't really been fighting very frequently. He had to take that year off after the Holloway fight, so I'd like to see him a little more active. i got a couple names for the matchmaking, which we'll talk about in just one second brother so with that being said man um that is the recap but let's do a little bit of matchmaking brother so uh i'm just gonna keep it on this recap here and we'll just talk matchmaking how about that or i'll do this you know instead how about boom we'll move it to that I know I got that poster up. I'll take that down for a second. Let's talk matchmaking now. All right, brother. I think we can run through this pretty quickly because, uh, you know, we got some pretty definitive stuff, but there's some interesting fights regardless, man. And one of the first ones that I wanted to talk about was the one we just started with, uh, Calvin Cater versus, you know, Giga Chikadze. So it's, is it fair? Could he move up even one spot in the division? Number four is Chan Sung Jung, who's getting the next title shot. It kind of makes sense for him to just stay where he's at, at number five. You defended your number. Cool. But let's talk about opportunities to move up, man. There's two fighters right now that I feel like make sense um, for a Calvin Cater to fight, given that number four is about to fight the champion, Chan Sung Jung and Alexander Volkanovsky. So those two fighters, number one is Brian Ortega. You know what I mean? He hasn't fought him yet. Striker wrestler versus striker grappler. Ortega's the odd man out since he lost to the champ last. So there's re it's really tough to see like where's Ortega going to go unless he's going to wait it out. Or number three ranked Yair Rodriguez El Pantera, who hasn't won a fight since 2019 and is kind of just holding up that uh, that number three spot, which I don't know if he rightly deserves. I don't know if there's such a thing as deserve, but I don't know if he deserves that number three spot. So it's like Cater could jump into that number three spot and and firmly have that chance to fight Holloway again or maybe get a shot against the, the champ. But I think those are the two names that make sense. What do you think? Yeah, those are the exact two names I have, man. Yair, T-City, it's kind of the only way to really go about this if you're uh, Calvin Cater. Yeah. I think both make for very interesting fights, very different fights, the two of them. But I think either way, that's where we're looking to go for Calvin Cater. Is it fair, though, that Yair, Yair Rodriguez is number three? Like, don't you think in a way <laughs> that maybe it should be Chan Sung Jung at three and then Cater at four and then Yair at five? Just because even though he had such a great matchup against Holloway, I mean, at the end of the day, you haven't won a fight since 2019, man. Like, what are you doing to deserve number three? You, yeah. I mean, losing, I mean it's, uh, yeah. go ahead. I was just say losing, losing a pretty definitive decision to Max Holloway, you know what I mean? Like, that's what keeps you at number three. Like, it just confuses me a little bit. What do you think? 
Yeah, it's it's very the MMA math man yeah. very confusing because I agree he, maybe uh, it does yeah the style of Yair and like the his his you know c- combat skills deserve number three probably yeah. it's close but not losing or not winning a fight since 2019 getting put on by Max Holloway there there's other factors out there that I think go into it yeah. and you know there's there's needs to be some shifting going on in those rankings we'll see though we'll see I definitely think they need to fight it out to get that spot yeah. we'll see. And to, just to be fair, um, let's take a look at where we have them in our respective uh, rankings. I have Yaya Rodriguez at, oh, damn, I have him at three, too. Look at me, man. What about him? I, I mean, I might need to do some readjusting. And let me see. You got him at three. We both got him at three, brother. So, yeah, we might. Rankings update next week. We'll see what happens, folks. All right, Jake Collier, brother. I told you, uh, spoiler alert, I think he should fight Parker Porter next, man. Parker, Jake Collier moves up to about number 46. Parker Porter is about number 43. Um, Porter's last one was against Chase Sherman, and he cruised to a decision victory collier was able to stop him you know i think that that'd be a fun matchup another one that i have aj is dante mays and the reason why is because lord kong i believe is his nickname man he showed off a little grappling himself dude was like humping dude in the face or whatever you know what i mean hip thrusts um but he showed off a little bit of grappling so i was like if collier welcomes a fight you know a heavyweight that could grapple a little bit man i think that could be a fun matchup dante mays is big strong tall long all those things who do you have for jake collier in this heavyweight division See, I had Dante Mays as well, but the one I'm leaning a little bit more towards is Juan Espino, man. We haven't oh. seen him fight since he, he got, what is it, like three nut shots against Alexander Romanov. Yeah, yeah I wasn't <laughs> able to continue with just getting blasted on to the cup. Uh, I think it'd be a good fight for Juan Espino, yeah. man. Yeah, I, 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 he, needs, he needs to come back. He needs to have a good fight. And he's very dangerous on the ground as well, yeah. very heavy hands. Like you said, he just had that embarrassing outing in the last one, so I think he deserves kind of a good fight. Yeah. I like it as far as Juan Espino, although I th- feel like in that whole mix, because Juan Espino's in there with Dontel Mays, they're all below um, – um, Philippe, Carlos Philippe boy. Yeah. Um, they're all kind of in that mix right there. I think any one of those in there would be a good fight for Jake Collier. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I actually, I didn't pick Juan Espino just because I felt like you need to win a fight against Mayes or Parker before you can get up to Espino's level. That's how dangerous of a fighter I consider him to be. So you think either of those would work, man? If you give him the step up in competition, I mean, go ahead, give him the step up, man. You know, you know what time it is. Um, all right, brother, Brandon Roy Val. I think he stays at number five. It's just kind of tough to maneuver through that division, especially if this is your first win um, in a couple of fights, you know. Brandon Moreno, you fought the champ, and then you fought Pantoja, so there's nothing to be lost there either way. Um, basically, AJ, this is the news for this one. Everybody in the flyweight division right now is currently booked um, and has a fight, except Alessandre Pantoja, who just defeated Roy Val in their last fight via second-round submission. So I say you have to just play the waiting game because you have to see how the division shakes out. So the winner of number six, Kai Car France, and number two ranked Askar Askarov could be a fun fight. Or the winner of number four ranked Alex Perez and number nine ranked Matt Schnell. Either of those fights could be fun, but I just have a hard time placing him just because everyone's booked up. So what do you think about those? I, I like them. I, I, I like those a lot more because they're keeping uh, uh, Roy Val advancing. Yeah. Personally, man, I went down. I, I went back for him just to find somebody who he could fight. I wanted to see Matus Nicolau. You know, I think that'd oh, be a great yeah. fight. It'd be a good scrap. Somebody they haven't matched up with yet. But again, that's dropping down into the rankings. I have yeah. Matus at number nine. I think the, the UFC and you have him at eight. So I think it'd be an interesting match as far as keeping Roy Val busy. But if he wants to move up, I agree with you. That Kai Kara France fight, that sounds like a, a good one going forward. Matt Schnell would be a hell of a matchup if he can win his next one. I like anywhere that's keeping Roy Val busy because I think he just kind of lost a lot of steam with the last two losses. Didn't really pick up the same amount of steam in this win. So I feel like he needs another one, another two to kind of get back into that you know championship track. What do you think? Yeah. yeah, no, I hear you, man. And what's uh, actually interesting is that even though it's a fun fight, uh, Matus Nicolau, he's matched up right now against David Dvorak, right? So that's number oh. eight versus number 10. So that's what I'm saying. It's like you just got to play out for a winner, man, because that flyweight division, it's going to be a lot of shaking up in the next couple of months, man, with all of these fighters already matched up, man. So either way, I think, you know, bright things on the future for Brandon Roy Val, but any one of those could be fun. Now for Caitlin Chikagian, AJ, we already talked about it, man. It's like, where do you go? And I got three names. You can go just. Gondrage rematch if that's something you're interested in but that's you know that's the easy one right 
Or you could just say, all right, you want to fight anyone? You got to fight Tyler Santos next, brother. You know, somebody got to fight her, man. Nobody, it seems like people don't really want to fight her because okay, and she's like, I'll fight anybody in the top 10 who I haven't fought. But she hasn't specifically been like Tyler Santos. Like, let's fight. You know what I mean? I don't think anybody, I think she kind of like a boogie woman in the division a little bit, right? But the other name, AJ, that it's just everyone is going to say because why wouldn't you? You know what I mean? Misha Tate, she's now making her, her debut in the flyweight division. She's going to fight Lauren Murphy. But if you're any of these fighters, you grew up watching Misha Misha Tate. Like, Misha Tate was the legend, the pioneer. She's just back. You know what I'm saying? It's like GSP when he returned. It's like, oh, oh, fuck, GSP. Like, okay. You know, so it's like, why wouldn't you take the money fight against Misha Tate? Because she's the biggest draw, the biggest name in the division, even though she hasn't even fought in the division yet. And two, it's just like, you know, it's that, that, that person you grew up watching that you idolize. It's like fighting Jose Aldo. It's like, oh, my, of course I'd fight Jose Aldo, you know? Not, not me. I don't want no smoke. But you know what I'm saying? Fighters. It's a fighter's dream to do that. So, um, yeah, Tyler Santos, Misha Tate, or Jessica Andrade. What do you think, though, about that Misha Tate name, man? Like, if you're, if you're anybody in the division, aren't you calling for Misha Tate? I like where your head's at, yeah. Derek. I definitely think that's the call out to make, yeah. man. I, I think Tyler Santos is the fight to make. But if you're looking, if you're if you're Caitlin Kagan trying to make some waves, trying to get a little bit of media, trying to get paid, yeah, yeah Misha Tate all day, man. You got to take that cupcake fight for sure. I love, I, I like where your head's at with that thinking one, man, because yeah. uh, it's it's the way to go. I mean, you know, maybe maybe not as far as like a dedicated hardcore fight fan, mm -hmm. but if you're looking to make a fan of the casuals, you're looking to get a little bit more steam your way. Yeah. Why not? I think that's the perfect fight to make. And that might be what she needs to get over the top to get that Valentina rematch, you know? Because Chukagan, she's, like, just beating these people, and she just becomes the first. I didn't mention it earlier, but Chukagan becomes the first fighter to rack up 10 wins in the UFC without one single stoppage. All decision wins, man. So it's, like, kind of boring, but at the same time, I mean, dominance is dominance, man, you know? Not mad at Habib when he's just smashing people, right? So, you know. <laughs> All right, brother. Uh, Vyashlav Borishev, you know, Slava Claus. Listen, man, he went from not being ranked to ranked number 105 in the division. So now that's a big jump up, and now you get another big test. Uh, I'm not going to say Dakota Bush wasn't a big test, but, you know, that was your entry to the UFC. Come on in. I don't even remember. That could have been a short notice bout. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. That's neither here nor there. You can go anywhere here, brother. So I'm interested in who you have. Who do you have for Slava Claus next? Man, I want to see him fight Rafa Garcia. Ooh. I think it's a hell of a matchup. Big hands, bro. It's going to be a good fight. Both a little bit, uh, I would say Rafa has the advantage on the ground game, but I think that's a vicious fight, man, for both of these dudes. Big, heavy hands. Rafa's kind of getting lost in that little bit of a limbo area where he's won a couple, he's lost a couple, he's up and down, but he's a really good name and a really hard fighter. We've been talking about Rafa Garcia for, I don't know, man, six, seven months, something like crazy on this show because he's, he's a scrapper, man. He's a really good scrapper, and I think it's a great, all not introduction fight, but a great introduction fight and meaning like a, this is this dude's the real deal. You know, it's a it's a step up for Slava coming in, man. And I think it's a great fight. What do you think? I agree with you, man. Here, let me get myself back. I agree with you right there. I think that Rafa Garcia got massive power in his hands. I think he got a much needed victory in his last outing, which was a wrestling approach. It wasn't even like a real striking approach, which was kind of cool to see. Um, but I, I mean, like I said, he can go anywhere there. So that'd be a fun striking matchup right there against a dog like Rafa Garcia. And I got a couple people who I think would be fun matchups too in terms of the striking department. So the first one that I got is uh, Rodrigo Vargas. And if you don't remember that name, maybe Kazula sounds a little more familiar. Kazula is a man that uh, he's most popular in the UFC for his illegal knee to Brock Weaver. Guy gave a dub to Brock Weaver, just smashed his knee and knee in when dude was down. It was kind of nasty, but he's a dog. He's a bring it type of fighter. Um, and he got he's coming off a win. His last one was against uh, Zhu Rong or Rong Zhu. You know, I don't want to mispronounce. Um, so I think that'd be fun just because the dude is a savage, man. He's such a beast. Like, let me just move it on over. Like, look at this dude, man. I'm going <laughs> to, you know, look, come on, man. 12 and 4, come fighting out of Mexico, man. Yeah, he lost to Alex De Silva, who was a very tough fighter you got the dq against brock weaver but aside from that man he's, he's a finisher he knocks people out man whether it's a decision whatever he, he's a finisher so i think rodrigo Var vargas or uh david onama believe it or not aj david onama is fighting out of glory mma and uh when you're looking at him he suffered his la his first loss in his ufc debut against mason jones which he took on very short notice but that was basically like a fight of the night type you know situation right there man it was such a fun fight david onama he was coming off of all knockout wins prior to that so it's like if we want to talk about striking contests versus and dudes who can grapple some bit both of these fighters vargas and onama can both uh handle those have good legit grappling chops 
But Borshev, man, um, listen, man, I just think that he just needs another dance partner that can bring him a really fun fight because he is must-watch TV right now. Would you agree? Oh, I agree with you 100%. I like all of those, to be honest. I really like the Kazula fight because you're right. Homeboy's a finisher. He's got power. He's got tenacity. He's fighting like a Mexican. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, there's, there's a lot to offer right there. Yeah. All that means is that there's paychecks going to be handed out left and right, man. I like it a Absolutely. lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. So lastly, for the matchmaking, man, Bill Algeo, Senior Perfecto. Um, he moved up to number four in the uh, featherweight rankings, and he defeated the non-ranked Joe Anderson Brito. But uh, this is another one where you can go anywhere, man. But I got a fun one right here. Just because it's like you're flowing you know you got that good striking well let's see what you can do against another really good striker how about number 46 ranked melsic bogdasarian and this is uh you know he's seven and one seven fight win streak right i think his last bout got canceled due to covid or an injury or something like that but he's a hot prospect with legit striking in the featherweight division and melsic's on a two fight win streak as well so it's like you're fighting a dude who's who, who, uh or He's on his two-fight win streak in the UFC, is what I meant. So it's like you're fighting a dude who's got a little bit of a streak in the company. I mean, Bill Algeo, he, you know, he wants to put together a two-fight win streak himself. I think that would be fun. Who do you have, brother? I, I went with the same kind of thought process. Yeah. You know, you feel like you're flowing. You feel like you got these flashy strikes. Yeah, you're long, limber. You know, you got all the stuff. I want to see him versus Mr. Highlight, man, Ludwig Ooh, Klein. Okay. I think that'd be a hell of a striking contest. Yeah. Very flashy, very fast, very fun. I like either of them, to be honest with you, man, because I like the, the style makes sense on that one. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what's funny is the other name that I had was um, Mike Trezano, the dude who actually beat <laughs> Ludovic Klein in his last fight, man, just because I was thinking these are two fighters who have great promise in the featherweight division. And Algeo earned a tough name after beating Joe Anderson Brito. So I thought that Mike Trezano, even though he's not the most known name, yeah, I think he was he fought on tough before and all that good stuff, man. But, uh, you know, like he, he came back and he had a very impressive win over Ludovic Klein. So that's the matchmaking, folks, man. Back, look, I love it, man. With the post show, we back at it, man. Did our matchmaking, did our fighter of the night rankings review, recap the main card, talked prelims, man. We basically did a whole entire retrospective of UFC Vegas 46, but that's what we're here to do. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, all right, AJ, let's talk about it. Brother, we got the, uh, you know, let me see. Nope, that's not it. Nope, nope, nope. Pause. That's not it. Let me see. I think this is it right here. All right, brother, back to the outro. You know what time it is, my man. Uh, hey, it, it's fun breaking it down with you, as always, brother. But next week, we got a pay-per-view on our hands. We got a big, big fight. Heavyweight championship fighting for the baddest man on the planet. Francis Ngannou versus Cyril Bongamin. Gone. Um, listen, man, this is what the UFC would call a unification bout. However, if you're Francis Ngannou, he says, I don't acknowledge anything um, that has to do with interim championship. That doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. And if anything, Derek Lewis and Cyril Gon fought for number three because Stipe should be number two. Those are the words of Francis Ngannou. So listen, man, the, he's got a chip on his shoulder and rightly so. Um, but let me pull this up a little bit, man. We also got uh, Brandon Moreno making his first title defense against Davis and Figueredo. This is the trilogy. Hopefully this will be the end, you know what I mean, of these two having to fight. But if Figueredo gets the dub... You have to imagine they run it back again. So this would just be an endless, <laughs> endless loop of fighting between uh, between those two. We've already kind of gone over the UFC 270 card, even though there have been a lot of changes, a lot of fights have been dropped, replacements, things of that nature. We'll talk about it next week, folks. But don't forget Mondays and Fridays at 8 a.m. That's when our shows drop. Short clips drop at noon, respectively, on Mondays and Fridays. And you can get the rub, you can get the know, everything you need at bloodywaterpodcast.com. But lastly, AJ, I said it for the millionth time, and I gotta say it again because I'm just so excited look at that brother come on bloody water podcast i got the hoodie we got the logo on the back and you can find that exclusively at our website man go hit up the merch tab at our website and use code bwp10 for 10 percent off your all purchases at checkout man how many times do i gotta say it that's all right brother all right aj man you got any last words for the people Woo, yeah, go put you out. Like Derek said, man, go hit us up on the website. Get yourself some game, man. Get looking good for the people out there. Show them some love. Let us know, man. Hit us up what you think in the comments. If you got these right too, man, let us know. We're always interacting with you. We love it out there in the comments. And like Derek said many a time, man, there's a little there's a little button over here. Come hit us with some money. Hit us, help us out, you know, help us grow this show even more, but all even better. Hit us with the subscription, the comments, pass it on to the friends. That one helps out it tremendously. You have no idea how much we love and appreciate.
appreciate it. And if you made it this far in the show, man, thank you, man. We love it. I love you rocking with us. We'll be here next week. We got a big fight coming up for this champ champ. You see the picture in the corner. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. And thank you for rocking with us to the moon, man. We're growing to the moon, man. You know what time it is, man. So this is just the first week of many to come in 2022. Like I said, AJ's out to the early lead four and two. I am three and three. So, you know, I got to get one back next week. We'll see what happens. It's going to be competitive. It's going to be fun. But that's it for us, folks. Until next time. Peace.